Hi, good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight at uh, Inside Out, Outside In, Second Nature in Japanese Architecture. After the talk, we invite you to join us for a drink uh, in the reception if you don't want to go outside immediately. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers tonight, uh, Ms. Raquel Ratem and Fu Huang of Modu, Principles of Modu. Um, Ms. Ratem is founding director and studio futurist at Modu Architecture. She holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Technion in Haifa and Masters in Advanced Architectural Design from Columbia University. Um, she currently teaches graduate level studio at MIT. Mr. Huang is a founding director and studio alchemist at Modu. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the Georgia Institute of Technology and Master of Architecture degree from Columbia. He's currently adjunct professor at GSAP at Columbia, and we are so pleased um, to have them here tonight, and I'm very much looking forward to their presentation about their experiences and their practice, and um, I'll be having a short Q&A with them at the end. So welcome, um, Rakeli and Fu. Hi, good evening. Thank you for coming, um, especially in this weather. Uh, we're going to be talking about weather tonight. So um, I wouldn't first thank Beatrice for the introduction and, and certainly to the um, uh, Japan Society for inviting us. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, especially after the experiences we had living in Japan. I um, also want to thank um, for making our um, our trip to Japan possible, the National Endowment for the Arts, the U.S. the Japan-U.S. Friendship Commission, and the U.S.-Japan Creative Artists Program. So um, our interest in weather is because it's both a collective and an individual, individual activity. Each shared experience is different. Um, we, as, as we know, no one can really agree on what the weather is, perhaps except for today, which we all know is freezing cold. Um, these are time-lapse videos uh, taken always during the same time of day over a, a period of a month, in this case, over the skies of Rome. And what we're interested in is how this shows weather change that is normally invisible when not looking at, uh, when not looking at a single image. Um, if each one of these individual videos is weather, the 16 together over a month is climate. And this is a, something that we've been interested in for a while, which is this relationship between weather, which is immediate and can be experienced, and climate, which is uh, abstract and uh, can be politicized easily. Um, our uh, interest in, in climate change is, is an idea that, oops. we're interested in climate change because we see it as a social project as well as an environmental one. We're trying to change people's perception through designing for more connections between the outdoor and the indoor, between the urban and the interior, and between the collective and the individual experience. Two years ago, Raquel and I were fortunate enough to be awarded the Rome Prize in Architecture, and we spent a year living at the American Academy in Rome. This was our backyard, very fortunately. Um, this is the back garden of the American Academy. It's bounded on all walls by um, a 300-year-old uh, stone, uh, the, one of the original uh, walls of, of the city. And for us, it's what we were calling an outdoor room. It's both interior and it's both exterior. And we spend a lot of time here uh, actually talking about a lot of these relationships that we're interested in between indoor and outdoor. And then nine months after returning back from Rome, we were fortunate to be um, uh, awarded a fellowship to live in Japan for three months. So we spent this past summer in Japan. Um, this is where it began, uh, the first two days. We were very sad to leave this beautiful place. This is the International House of Japan, uh, built in the early 1950s, uh, post-war uh, institution to bridge uh, cultural institutions between the US and, and Japan. This map is um, two things for us. One, which is about our uh, our, our practice, which is that we are practice that for 10 years has been practicing in New York, but also that we um, uh, have uh, been uh, working while uh, living in Rome as well as in Japan, and our, a lot of our projects are abroad as well. Um, and, but it's also a personal map. I'm uh, originally, uh, both Rachele and I, we are we're immigrants. Um, I was born in Vietnam, raised in the US. Rachele is from Israel. Um, and we both, what we like to say is that it's in New York where our two different climate types have come together, um, working uh, in, in our practice. Um, but part of our work, I think, is this cultural background, which is um, uh, tropical wet and dry and arid. 
This is the map, a map of Japan. We were originally interested in going to Japan to look at the, um, to look at the seven distinct climate types and to experience these climate types and understand how um, the, the climate in Japan of um, a very small island that has so many different climate types, how it affects the design of architecture over time. But what ended up happening was that we went during the summer, so it was hot. It was extremely hot. Um, in July and August, in Tokyo on average, it was over 100 degrees with at least 70% humidity. And what we did experience though, were four different kinds of extreme weather events. There were heat waves, or two months of it was, <laughs> it was a heat wave, uh, earthquakes, typhoons, and floods. And often we would be going from one place to another and just having missed something that happened in the town that we had just left. A lexicon of terms, um, a form of creating conversation between us, hybrid synthesizing environment and architecture inside and outside. Uh, it forms a concept uh, that we're interested in and it, the kind of transfer it from research to, to project that we have in our practice. Okay, I'm not doing it correctly. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, they also, uh, they also represent our two cultures. Fu is uh, reading and writing from left to right, and I'm from right to left. Our logic works in the same manner. Uh, <laughs> um, so for us, these kind of terms of contradiction and looking at it from two angles is a way of communicating. Our work uh, explores new sustainability, uh, one that connects humans to cities, humans to environment, and humans to one another. We believe that creating social, uh, social groups are, is a form of sustainable living. And in this macro is the idea that when we connect, we promote wellness. And despite the experiences that we had in Japan and elsewhere of extreme weather, we are looking for ways to connect or opportunities to do so because we do believe it's part of our kind of well-being. Um, and in that sense, breaking a cycle of constantly being in, in a mechanical engineered uh, environment with a singular kind of indoor experience and, and that kind of mechanical engineering um, is actually promoting more heating of the outdoor environment and supporting um, climate change. Um, so one of our terms of our lexicon that we're debating is second nature. Um, I'll read it so you can see it better. So in a bare concrete library in Tokyo, one must lower the voice upon entering. In, uh, intuition informs us of a design for social habits, an architecture of both forms of second nature, expressing social codes that are embedded in the architecture and uh, promoting environmental boundaries. Architecture and nature as extension of each other. Okay, so the first project we're going to show you today is in, in Israel, in the outskirts of Tel Aviv. Uh, it's basically um, uh, a bare uh, plaza in front of the Holon Design Museum that was um, designed by uh, uh, London architect Ron Arad. And the idea is how you take a plaza that is um, unused during the day because it's, if, if you've ever been to the Middle East, it's very hot, there's a lot of radiation and reflections, and how do you make it more approachable for people to actually use? Uh, we looked, the first thing that we want to introduce into the square would be shade. A shade that is not only dependent on the movement of the sun, but shade that can be uh, um, uh, a kind of um, dependent on the breeze, the breeze from the Mediterranean waters that flush the city in the afternoon. Um, so the idea of a dynamic place architecture that uh, create, uh, basically is, uh, is formed by the environment. We deployed 30,000 balls, lightweight balls, uh, on a suspended ceiling. And this is one uh, kind of scenario out of many of how these balls are distributed in our field and creating ever-changing shade. This is kind of a, a view from below of that landscape that is suspended over a lightweight mesh.
So uh, looking at architecture of weather, you sh movies are uh, kind of the best way of looking at them. Um, so this is a view from below on the mesh, the suspended ceiling that has to be completely uh, aligned so the balls would not uh, stagger in one location using, um, using greenhouses structure that are very common in Israel um, to support this pavilion. <coughs> and allowing to the wind to take over the pavilion and basically keep on changing the relationship of, of the shade. So once this kind of architecture of incomplete, uh, part of the pavilion is filled with, uh, um, with balls and part of it are not for, to allow for this movement. Uh, once the architecture is there, then people start to um, take, o take over the pavilion. It was not about uh, um, okay, um, it was not about constraining a certain program underneath, but allowing to people for the users to um, kind of utilize in different ways. So it became part of the path in the city um, and created a life of its own. The best compliment is this, the kids with ball take over. That, that is definitely my favorite part. Okay, another video. Yeah. So architecture that has hybrid with the environment, um, this is um, a different research that we did on um, merging structure with, uh, with wind through the notion of flexibility using carbon fiber. Um, carbon fiber is 10 times stronger than steel and five times lighter. And what we really enjoyed about the quality of this material that is actually very flexible. And if we are um, kind of expect our structure to be very strong. The idea is can we, um, can we uh, think of strong as also a form of flexibility and that's something that also in the Ch Japanese society, something uh, flexibility is part of how, how they build. Um, and this idea that you kind of experiment with different uh, structure to be able to create different experiences with the environment. So if we are going to Japan now, and I think the weather is better than here, um, so to understand a city like Tokyo, you, you need to understand, you understand it better when you go to the mountains and the forest. 67% um, of, uh, of the land in Japan is actually covered with a forest. And 25% uh, of the population in Japan lives in, out in, in Tokyo. So it's kind of interesting kind of relationship between them. One, it's very kind of dense cities, and on the other hand, most of the land is populated uh, with the forest. Um, when they were trying to attempt to rebuild in, uh, in the forest, in the mountain, it actually created um, floods and landslides, and through time they realized that they, would need, they need a forest to be able to, to kind of um, stable, the, stable the grounds. So the forest was also a place of culture, myth, and spirituality in uh, Japanese architecture. And when you do visit the forest and nature in Japan, you understand better the city. Um, two types of nature, um, actually different degrees of design of nature. On the right is the botanical gardens in Tokyo, uh, which took hundreds of years of cultivating it to look wild. Um, and on the left, and on the left we see a groomed um, to be noticeable and, and being appreciated uh, garden um, in Tokyo. And the idea that uh, those gardens are designed and part of the design craft uh, in, in kind of in, in Japan kind of society. 
and it, this kind of craft knowledge is, is something that is passed between generations, an invisible form of design. I'm um, really interested in this scroll, which is almost 20 feet long, and you can see three segments on the left, which represent the whole story. It's a story about rice, which is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is, uh, what would we make from the rice, food or sake? Um, <laughs> very important. Um, so this story is basically a form of a film with five different perspectives um, representing that debate and, and dispute. And what's interesting for us is the idea that you move from one scene to another, it's indoor, it's outdoor, it's indoor, it's outdoor, it's indoor again. Uh, the, the nature and the build are equally represented. And on the right side of the screen, you can see two scenes that are um, kind of uh, transition between, between scenes. And what's interesting is there are clouds, and the clouds are part out outdoors and part, part indoors, so indoor clouds. And the idea that the environment belongs to both the outdoor and the indoor. Um, this is an example of a house that literally brings the garden in by Ru Nishizawa. Uh, the garden uh, becomes a wall, a facade, a, a place, an object, a comfort. Um, and in each room in the house, it, either it's a living room or a private room, it behaves differently and provides a different experience. Kind of a, a new hybrid, a literal hybrid, and the name of the project by itself is garden and a house. They're equally important. Um, happily wild bush on the right, happily con constrained, and on the left, a tree with support, uh, carefully taken care of. You see elder people in Tokyo go out with water and uh, grooming the nature around them in kind of islands uh, in the street. So it's really taking care of the trees is, is part of kind of living. Uh, and a glimpse to um, Kate workshop by Ishigama, a place of making. Um, and in this project, you would see the hybrid of the idea of taking the forest and bringing it into architecture. Um, so there are forest density and there's forest clearance, and the clearance is where the furniture are and the work that uh, is happening. Um, and what's interesting about this building, to create this lightweight and the feeling of a forest, they uh, took up a lot of the mechanical system that are usually hidden. Um, so, um, um, Air conditioning um, units are put on the, instead of putting put on the um, on the ceiling are, are put on the side as a as a machine that is part of the aesthetic of the place and it's celebrated. Air ducts uh, are um, disappeared and also bathrooms. There is mm -hmm. no bathroom there. So the idea of what is a building and what we need to expect from a building is a question here. Um, so to be, to be able to find a bathroom, you would need to leave the Kate um, workshop, go through uh, the or, uh, um, through the um, uh, kind of uh, the trees around it, and find wander around to find a bathroom and come back. And this kind of process of moving in and out and in is deliberately uh, done as part of the experience of the building. Um, one of the projects we worked on when we were there, um, in, especially in Tokyo, was a project with, where we had conversations, interviews, with seven Japanese architects that spanned over five generations. This represents about 60 years of Japanese architecture culture. Um, and from um, the beginning, uh, an architect like Fumi Fumihiko Maki, who is now 89 years old, was one of the original metabolists, a student of Kenzo Tange, um, to more recent architects like Go Hasegawa and Akihisa Harata, Generation 5. These, these practices were, they really kind of, especially Akihisa's uh, practice emerged out of the 2011 uh, earthquake, which um, across the board, in, in whenever we spoke to the architects, they, that event really transformed their, the, the way they thought about architecture. Um, and what we found was that the way that we did it was that we spoke to each of these architects and asked, began with the same set of questions. 
um, to see what are the links between them, but also to uh, be able to have a discussion uh, on topics that overlap between our interest and, and what we enjoy about their own work. This relationship between the inside and outside, between the small scale and the vast urban, in between um, what we call the incomplete nature of architecture. And what was interesting were that ideas were passed from generation to generation, and in a way, some projects that may have been done by Fumihiko Maki were still being developed uh, by other architects, versions of it or, or new, um, kind of new, new iterations of it 50 years later. So one question that we asked was about this boundary, um, the boundary between architecture and the environment, between inside and outside. Um, and we asked this of, of all the architects, but I want to discuss two responses, one by Fumihiko Maki of Maki and Associates, and uh, Ryu Nishizawa, who, is, who has his own office, uh, office of Ryu Nishizawa. He's also the partner of uh, Kotsuyo Sejima uh, in, in, in the firm Sana. And what was interesting is they both kind of had the same response. They said that there, first of all, there is no boundary between the inside and outside. And what they're interested in is this in-between space, the space in between the inside and outside, or between the building and between the urban. Um, uh, and when we look at two of their projects in particular, on the left is Hillside Terrace uh, uh, by Maki, and on the right, Moriyama House by um, Nishizawa. Hillside Terrace, one could imagine or one could argue is a building at the scale of a city, while Moriyama House is a city at the scale of a house. Now there's 40 years that separate these two projects, but they're very much in conversation with each other. Hillside Terrace is a project that Maki did over 30 years. There are six phases um, and one client. Um, that client was uh, the, the kind of enlightened client that we all hope to get as architects, um, uh, who had a very large plot of land uh, post-war and wanted to um, uh, build on it over, slowly over a period of time. He made a decision to widen the street to make it more, um, uh, more public, but also he did not want to build to the maximum height requirements. That The width of a street in Tokyo is, determines the, the, um, the, the height. Um, what he wanted to, so what happens as a result is a project in which um, so the six phases were done over 30 years, and what you end up, what they end up doing was creating each one of these buildings uh, individually, but also thinking about the relationship of the building to the other, that the in-between space is as important as the building itself. Um, and the, the, there's a really kind of, uh, let's say, uh, I thought it was a very simple and elegant um, idea that, that he had, which was that he, he's designing these in-between spaces for a tree, a tree and its shade. Um, and you know, like you kind of see in these images, you can't totally see, but um, you can't, you, the 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 this the in between spaces are um, the space in which um, the the building and the environment kind of mix together. Um, and Ryo Nishizawa also was designing for a space of a tree in a way. Um, this this house um, on the, the image on the right is a relatively uh, large house for for Tokyo. Uh, and what is really interesting about this project is that instead of having a house in which you have it, it's enclosed in its, its entirety, the house is uh, divided, each room is divided into a small building. So when you go from one room to the other, you pass through an outdoor space. Um, that outdoor space is, in a way, part of the street. Um, and uh, what, in a way, it, I think it succeeds so well in that there's this sign on the, that you see on the right, which <laughs> is there and basically telling people do not walk into our home because it, there's a kind of continuity between the street and the environment and uh, you're supposed to stand in a very specific spot to take the photos. <laughs> but what was interesting is that, you know, we knew this project and a lot of the projects we've shown, we, we knew before traveling there, but when we were there, we realized that this project is actually just a continuation of what's happening in the neighborhood. The neighborhood is already very small scale buildings and what, what uh, Nishizawa's design was um, a further uh, kind of atomization of, of that scale. Um, so it feels very much to be, uh, you know, very much kind of fits with the, with the neighborhood. Um, I, think I had to step away to read. <laughs> um, so this is the, the next kind of uh, lexicon turn, um, incomplete gaps, moving between one to another, avoid for wind to pass through, seeking momentary cool respite from an overheated cities. Eyes need to get used to a change in light intensity. There is the potential for multiple futures and scenarios, 
space for individual freedom within a collective. Architecture itself is never complete, but perhaps made whole in connecting people with the environment. This is a project that we did in Beijing, in the um, Olympic Park. Uh, Beijing is very well known for its uh, very bad air quality, um, and we were uh, really uh, struck by this idea that you would wake up one morning uh, and there'd be a building across the street, you wake up the next morning and the building's gone. Um, so it's this idea of the city that appears and disappears, which we translated into a concept about the city in the room and the room in the city. This idea of the same space, as the ch scale changes, it's uh, your experience changes uh, between interior and, and urban. Um, and it, we show it because this, this also was important for us, like the gaps in this project, the gaps are filled by the air, the, the air pollution. And um, what we had designed was basically a, a small uh, semi-interior room within a very large urban space. It has a hole in the, in the ceiling, and the, the idea of the hole is that it frames views towards the Olympic um, buildings that recognize that that's the... Um, uh, what used to be the, the TV building for the, the Olympic Games. And that view changes over time, depending on what the weather is. Um, it took us a very long time to get this photo. When we do projects about weather, then we never get the right weather to, to photograph it. Um, but it happened after a while. Um, so, And it, we saw it as a kind of barometer for air pollution, where we chose a fabric that's both translucent and reflective, an architectural textile, so that it changes in, in, in a way that the building itself changes as the air quality around it changes. This is a project that uh, uh, we show it because if outdoor room is a, a kind of interior space in an outdoor um, uh, public space, then this project is a, um, is, would, be the, would be the opposite, something interior that we're trying to connect. Um, it was a collaboration we did with Frog Design, the product design and technology firm. It's for a major telecommunications company in, in Los Angeles. Um, and what we're, what we're kind of the mission was to um, think about the future of retail, where you're not actually selling any products, but actually selling experiences. And the experiences in this case were, was technology, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, experiences. Um, and the way that we designed it was, um, sorry, I have to. I don't have it. Yeah. Um, the, the, the way that we designed it was that there were um, moving curtains, um, and those curtains and bleachers, so these objects move on tracks, um, either tracks above or tracks below, and allow different configurations and different scales. So you can have three simultaneous events, or you may have uh, you know, two events, one event. So this idea of like taking something like a vi virtual reality experience, which is very inward focused and very kind of personal, and we would project uh, what someone sees on the virtual reality on large screens to, to make it more collective. And at the same time, even having elements like the bleacher moving to the outdoor plaza, uh, again, kind of connecting both um, the in individual and collective and the uh, inward and outward experiences. Um, this idea of incomplete gaps um, in, um, actually, sorry, in Tokyo, there's a city of, of gaps. Unlike European cities that are made of walls, Tokyo is a city of independent buildings that are constantly changing. The, this explains the subdivision. What you're seeing in the video are those gaps, which is required by code, that every bit lot has one building, and on every building, all four sides, you need to set back from the wall uh, by half a meter. So there are these one meter gaps, these light shafts that um, are throughout the city. Um, and we, we were really interested in these, like this idea that, you know, like this is in a way a, a lot of what we think about, which is like, is there an opportunity from something that has been overlooked, uh, something that's kind of ignored? As a result, what happens is that the city is constantly changing because you have one building to a site. Uh, when, you, um, when you acquire a, a property, most of the time in Tokyo, they tear it down. The average life of a, of a building in Tokyo is 26 years. It is a, it's a city with 1.8 million landowners because you can, um, as the, the properties, and you can kind of see here in this, in this dra drawings from 1940 to 2005, I think, um, the city has become more and more fine scale. Um, and we were interested in not only that change of the city, but also these gaps. Um, 
uh, which are actually quite cool. And we were literally putting our heads into them <laughs> in the, during the summer. Um, but we're also interested in how these gaps are design opportunities. Like, can you take advantage of them and actually use their cooling capacity for something that would be uh, in your project? And the, I think the Moriyama house that I showed is an example. Um, this project by um, Katsuyo Sejima, the Sumida Hokusai Museum, uses gaps. Um, it's basically a building with four gaps on each side that come together. The image on the right is the Hokusai. That is the kind of central area, which is where all the gaps meet together. It's very cool. It has a, uh, the way that it's been designed. The wind moves through as well as the uh, lower temperature. Um, so we would take um, pictures with our thermal cameras. Um, this is a view of the gap from the, from the outside looking in. Um, and gaps are really important throughout Japanese architecture history. Um, these are two traditional forms of roof. On the left is a roof structure. Typically, Japanese traditional architecture, they don't use a single beam to support a roof. They actually break it up into multiple beams and space them such that there's actually gaps in between. And on the right, a kind of roof system made of reeds in um, Katsura Villa that is, um, the, the, there's actually air in between the, the reeds themselves, and the reed is made of air. So in a way, one, one could say that you know, much of Japanese traditional architecture is air. And um, in here, this myth of, um, of the earthquake, uh, this very earthquake-prone country, uh, this is an old Japanese myth about a catfish that lives underneath the island that causes earthquakes. But what we're fascinated by is that the traditional Japanese joints, structural joints, have gaps in them. Those gaps were, were engineered in order to allow for movement. So during seismic activity, the, um, it was actually kind of very early form of anti-seismic um, engineering. Pairs uh, from our conversation on the left, Kego Kuma, and on the right, Takaharu and Hu uh, Tezuka. Um, we asked them the question about how do you design uh, in a granular condition that uh, things are getting smaller on one hand, yet the city is vast, and how do you mediate between those two um, kind of scales? Uh, I hope that you can see their responses, uh, but Kegokuma was always saying that scale is relative, so whenever you approach one thing, you discover something that is actually smaller. And this idea that you can constantly go uh, and change scale and go to the smaller and smaller grain until you find a pixel, and when you find a pixel, you find a hole. So he, the idea is working with layers of pixel to create a whole project. And uh, with Takahara and Hu, uh, they were responding to the idea of the small homes small houses in the center of a big city like Tokyo, and the idea that the smallness allows for diversity uh, and for different generation in that sense to contribute to uh, the changes in the city. So we're going to look at, uh, on, uh, we're going to kind of examine more closely two projects. On the left, uh, the Nezu Museum by uh, Kengo Kuma, and on the right, uh, the Fuji Kindergarten uh, uh, by the Takahara and Wii uh, Tezuka. What's interesting about them is they both use a roof as um, a unifier, as a kind of the main strategy uh, of the design. And both of them, at the end of the day, you see kind of the breaking down from a master urban kind of um, uh, um, intention to a more smaller and smaller scale. So in the left of the museum, you, you'd see two large buildings that have conversation with the street. And then the volumes are breaking into a smaller and smaller and smaller grain until they become a very small pavilion in a garden. And on the right, you would see an oval um, that is basically a shared roof for the kids to play on um, that is breaking, that this oval kind of separates in urbanistically the, the kids that are playing um, with kind of this inner um, courtyard, but um, um, it keeps on uh, breaking. Um, so if I move um, forward, the roof, uh, this is the entrance. The roof uh, is changing throughout the project and um, it can create a shade, kind of extension roof allows for a, a kind of a slimmer shade for an entrance. And on the inside, the roof changes from and directs you again to the outdoors. 
and you become and then you uh, basically enter to the most interior place as we see it in the project which is the garden itself which is a place of seclusion and kind of um, serenity different materials for the roof again on the right you see how he uh, invent uh, using um, the uh, rice paper that we usually see in uh, the Japanese uh, sliding uh, panels we see them in the roof and basically allows us to see uh, to see the tree above and have different lights and shade relationship indoors um, in the kindergarten, what is interesting about it is if we are in the West, our custom for minimum of nine feet ceiling, we don't purchase real estate unless it's uh, above nine feet. In this project, the scale keeps on changing from one building to another until the minimum of six foot eight. And um, the idea of changing the scale and reducing it to, uh, to the youngest uh, youngest uh, toddler right which is building is used to is something that is really interesting in in specifically in this project it looks very unified but the scale keep on changing and we see diversity of it and it allows you for different experiences uh, as much as uh, there are actually classroom that as an adult you um, a grown person you would not come into so another term today social weather let me find it it's here okay um it is the last term we're going to speak tonight of um so outside the entry to a museum in a japanese uh, countryside there are hot spring foot baths for tired feet after wandering around this is where strangers meet sharing a moment of contradictions it is both indoor and outdoors warm and cool personal and collective a momentary pause between public and private expectations. Um, so we're going to show you a project that we've been working on recently. These projects were actually designed by us when we were in Japan, and it summarized a lot of uh, knowledge that we've been developing both in Rome when we went to see construction sites that were never finished and seeing open buildings in Japan uh, architecture. It's an, an initiative uh, that uh, mobilized design to transform as cities, many underutilized urban properties. Neglected buildings in a state of decay that already have a relationship with nature, uh, trees grow in, a seed comes in, a little water, and uh, something starts to grow. And the idea of uh, this specific building that is um, intended for formerly industrial and inf infrastructural or a civic building is to insert a 20% of infrastructure into the space, a, a kind of freestanding. It can be assembled and disassembled. And this 20% should be, uh, in a sense, a collaborative effort with the communities to understand what they are for each specific community. We imagine it here as a space for learning. And it merges both indoor and outdoors. There are different um, uh, radiate ceilings that allow you to have different kind of microclimate within the environment. If it's extreme cold or extreme heat, you are able to isolate different areas. But if the weather is temp uh, temperate, then it's much more of, of a free space. Uh, and the idea that you are encouraged to allow growth in this building, um, and it, the nature is part of the inside of those um, vacant spaces. Uh, another project we're working on, Newbor Newburg in upstate New York, taking the scale of, uh, 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 of residential project. There are 600 abandoned uh, buildings in Newburg. Um, it's, a, 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 it's kind of a, a huge tax load. Uh, the, the moment the building uh, is, becomes a dan uh, danger to is the environment, the city has to uh, spend a lot of money erecting it. So it actually makes more sense to figure out how to stabilize uh, those kind of half open buildings. And the strategy here is actually create a structural mat with, um, in that sense, uh, floor beams that supports those structure and give them extra time for life until they, found, they find a user uh, that will um, take them for the long-term uh, investment. And in between those beams, uh, we're designing these um, 
elements that can be removed, uh, you can see it in the blue, removed or, or assembled in different locations. Uh, these are basically rooms that can actually be more thermally uh, dynamic, uh, thermally uh, protected through radiant heat and these kind of curtains that uh, holds the heat in, indoors. Um, leaving the ground floor to be empty and for multi-programming and um, allowing the tree to continue growing, the tree that is already found in there. Um, here's some images about social weathers in, in, in Japan. Um, on the right, a, a small room for a grandmother that's in the threshold space between the building and the street. Um, she pops her head out uh, for a morning greeting for whoever walks by. So we, though we don't speak Japanese, we slowly got acquainted uh, to each other through this ritual of saying hello each morning. And on the left, an ice block that it's at every entrance to the Kanazawa Central Market during the summertime. So people pause, touch the ice, kind of have this moment of, uh, of gathering um, both environmental and social in, in a shared experience. And so whether it's with, for monkeys, no monkeys, or for humans, um, the bath is a space of well-being, both thermally and socially. Uh, he, on the right, that's the uh, foot baths in front of the Hakone um, Open Air. Uh, it's in the Hakone Open Air Museum, which is a very large uh, sculpture park, um, and in front of the, the interior part of the, of the museum. These two images are from Rionji Temple, which is in, in, um, in Kyoto. And there are two kinds of landscapes, a rock garden and a moss garden. And you kind of see, they're, obviously, they're really beautiful, picturesque qualities. And you imagine that, it, that you're supposed to sit and kind of uh, stop and, and, and look at them. But what was really interesting is that they are designed both for stationary viewing as well as for movement. And that you experience these, uh, these two spaces through the engawa, which is a, the Japanese word for the wraparound, uh, a wraparound porch. Um, traditional Japanese architecture is without walls, so the boundaries are made with differences in height and in material. So we're defining here um, the environmental boundaries, and this is what we're interested in. The, it, the image on the left is uh, 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 Isasaki, who was uh, uh, one of the metabolists, um, an architect who drew Rionji, but drew it with four different uh, angles. So you have uh, elevations, plans, um, and uh, it was called an axonometric. Um, and it, what, what we, how we understand it is that it's about movement, that the drawing is showing how the, the, the garden is meant to be experienced through movement. And similarly on the right, that perspective has five different points of view, five different perspectives, and um, these are the angles for it, right? So the, these spaces that we, we call threshold spaces, we call in, uh, weather rooms, are meant to be moved through. Um, here, uh, activity in movement is what defines these spaces. Um, embedding a social ceremony of how one enters a home, removing the, sh the, sh the shoe and the stones that allow for that. Um, and lastly, Katsuora Villa in, in Kyoto that was really informative to um, Western modernist architects in the 1950s. Walter Gropius came here and realized that the Japanese had been doing modernism for a few centuries. Um, uh, on, on the left is, is a, was a moon viewing platform that um, was meant to basically extend the interior so that you can have this experience with the, on, on full moons. I'm going to end with this project, which is, um, again, dealing with these kind of overlooked spaces um, that, we, that, we are, um, that we kind of work with. And uh, that it's an abandoned shipbuilding factory um, that's as high as the Tate Modern's turbine hall, 100 feet high, 300 feet long. Um, and we were commissioned by um, a client to, to develop it for a, a kind of mixed-use facility that would allow for manufacturing, education, exhibition, and, and office programs. And the way that we did it was that we, these are some of the kind of conceptual drawings we do, um, weather drawings, where we imagine that how do we separate these different zones and allow for both separation of different uh, climates so that some larger volume doesn't need as much heating and cooling and inner volumes do, but also still allow for the social connectivity between the different zones. So we proposed using what's called air curtains, um, basically jets, high velocity jets of air that invisibly separate one space to the other. So when you move from one section to another, it's as if moving through different climate types, uh, climate spaces. Um, this is a kind of a view of what it would look from the outside. And 
um, in the end, this, this part of the proposal that we did for this client was that it had been damaged by Hurricane Sandy um, extensively. And what we proposed was um, a, um, a, a kind of garden island that would be on the boat loading dock. And this garden island would capture water that comes from the, um, uh, the, the, that, the, do the dock, um, capture the water into cisterns in order to um, irrigate the, the plantings for this island. Um, so again, trying to connect between um, the weather and, and between the social. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They, they, they call it, don't they? Well, thank you so much for that um, really, I thought, really well organized and really detailed and thoughtful presentation. Um, I think it was, um, it was such a pleasure for me to see your work through your research, the way that you look at other people's architecture tells so much about, you know, your own um, yeah. ethics and your own um, principles when it comes to designing um, your buildings and when we saw your buildings at the end you know could really see um, where you're coming from it was great thank you so thank much you. Um, I wanted to talk a little a first sort of tackle the, the question maybe um, you talking talking a lot about weather and not so much you know climate change or you know what is do you see yourself as a, a studio that has a responsibility your enthusiasm for working with climate or, or is it are you interested in also the kind of responsibility of architects towards the environment and against working against climate change and working with um, issues of sustainability and so on? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of your projects were, were mm -hmm. temporary projects, something that you don't necessarily associate with uh, sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered if you could uh, sort of explain where do you situate your, your studio when it comes to those two sort of connected but different points? Sure. So uh, when you speak about climate change, you lose 50% of your audience. Uh, and we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, I think when you speak about weather, you speak about a personal experience that you can feel in your own sensorial kind of machine. And it makes you connect. And I think when you do that, you understand, you understand what it means. Uh, and for us, the idea of creating experiences with weather uh, may be allowed to change perception through this personal connection of you and your senses. I, I think also that there is um, embedded in the work a desire for low energy architecture, right? So um, having making decisions to not heat or cool all of a building, like this is the last one that we showed, but that only certain areas need to be heated and cooled. So um, we would allow for semi-exterior climates in the building, uh, basically allow people to, uh, depending on the activity, choose what they do. Mm -hmm. But you did mention the installations, that the installations that we've done, we always do think about it in a traditional sustainability sense. For example, um, uh, a project we did for our Basel, Miami Beach, all of the concrete footings were designed from the beginning to be um, donated and sunk in to create an artificial reef off the coast of Miami. And um, so as a result, we were working with marine biologists and um, our favorite uh, kind of annual update that we get are pictures of this reef um, and as it grows more and more coral. So. Excellent. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to ask you about that. Do you, what's your, um, as a studio, so interested in something, let's say, outside of architecture, like, like climate, um, what kind of collaborators do you have? Who do you work with? Who's your um, kind of go-to? We have many who we like. <laughs> <laughs> um, we Obviously, we work with uh, engineers and collaborators within the, the building industry. But for example, the Project of Miami, a uh, uh, marine biologist. We've worked with robotics engineers. We've worked with um, client scientists. Uh, an important uh, set of collaborators are those in the social sciences, because right. a lot of what we're talking about is, is, is like sociology, psychology. Um, we think that architecture should talk to people outside of our direct discipline and that especially the things that we're talking about, about connecting humans, natures, and cities requires us to uh, have an expanded um, team. <laughs> I think weather is a cultural project uh, we should all, all participate in. Uh, and in that sense, we try to 
uh, bring as many people and knowledges in to a project. Yeah. And does that change? Uh, you've worked in tons of different cities, <coughs> countries. Um, is there a more or less enthusiasm based on the expertise or based on the nationality? I mean, you said it's like it's everybody's project, but is there slightly more or less related to where you are? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I'm not sure I can um, answer it right now, but um, I don't want to put you. <laughs> I, I would say that every place we do try to find what's unique about it. So if it's in, in Tel Aviv to get the breeze that is very gentle, that penetrates in the city and, and make the people aware of that. Um, and in, in China, the idea of the air pollution, um, the story is when you experience the pavilion. Um, mm -hmm. And I think... Uh, that's when you understand what the project is about. Yeah. And as, as, as New Yorkers working outside of New York, you know, you're based in New York for so long, do you, um, do you bring New York with you when you go out there? Like, what's your relationship to this city? Um, when we travel and we're doing projects abroad, um, yes, we certainly as a practice bring the economic constraints of <laughs> being an architect in New York. Um, but what we bring is a knowledge about, I mean, New York and in general, the East Coast of the US is one of the hardest climates in the world to design for because it's extremely cold in the winter, as we know today, and extremely hot in the summer. So designing for those two extremes is really difficult. So, I mean, the opportunity to live and design things in Rome was amazing because we'd long wanted to, you know, having worked in New York for so long, we really wanted to work in a temperate climate that we could test a lot of the ideas we've been talking about. Um, I also wanted to ask a little bit about how you, uh, I mean, you have these two wonderful opportunities to be in Rome and to be in Japan. And obviously this came out of your you applied for those mm -hmm. fellowships, and, and so how much of your work is self-generated? This is something that, coming from England, you know, my uh, peer group in England and Europe, tons of architects simply do their own projects mm -hmm. and make their own proposals to local communities and, mm -hmm. you know, figure out festival participation and so on on their own. It seems to be much tougher mm -hmm. to do that in this city, in this mm -hmm. climate. What's mm -hmm. your relationship to your clients? How do you go about getting work? I think it's a good mix. Um, we do competitions and we have um, private clients or institutional uh, clients. Um, I think for us, the traveling is bringing uh, knowledge, learning from elsewhere and bringing it to our projects. And I think that's really important that research is not per se just for research, but how do you implement it? And for us coming back to New York, the idea is to bring those places and those experiences back here. And that's what we are doing with the uh, last project that we've shown today. In the project that Raquel showed, the Second Life one about um, these uh, abandoned or vacant um, buildings, that's a self-initiated project, as you as you describe. And that's you know we um, we structure our office to, and we say you know a certain amount of our time of the whole office, everyone in the office needs to work on something that is not fee-driven, which is I'm, I know it seems really counterintuitive, <laughs> but. Um, it's we, we, we do it in order because we know that doing projects like that, as we can says, brings knowledge in, but I think also is defining our client, um, that we are doing these things in order to, uh, instead of waiting for a client to come to us, we do the work to put it out there and talk to organizations and institutions that are, that are interested in, in these projects. And do you feel that you have agency to bring in your... Um your kind of agenda or your interest into those projects? Do you have to fight for that um, to make your kind of uh, your yeah. projects happen the way that you want them to? What's how does that work? I think at the beginning of our, our career, we did a lot of competitions, and the competi competition has their own constraints, and not necessarily the things that you're interested in are the ones that interest the uh, uh, the comp competition kind of jury. And, and now we feel we're trying to transition and say, this is what we really think is important for us. And let's give it life or let's try to give it life and, and kind of design for the maximum potential for that because we feel it's important. So it's it kind of reversing the role from competition that we answer for someone else's brief. Mm -hmm. We are designing the brief mm -hmm. with the project. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a little bit about your studio setup? Because 
in the introduction, uh, you're a studio futurist, you're a studio <laughs> alchemist. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe we should think about putting that. <laughs> so I, it is the, let's say the, um, if everyone has a spirit animal, we have our spirit uh, personality. I think that uh, architecture, I'm, I'm the studio alchemist. I think that architecture is about taking uh, very common, uh, maybe um, unvaluable things and making them really uh, valuable. So converting lead to gold would be the, the alchemy. It's also the right to left and the left to right. I think that uh, you give me many things that have nothing to do with one another and I can make a soup from the bottom or I can try to connect. And I think in that sense, that's my spirit animal. Um, so I think that's how we define what we do and how we do it. Way of working. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, it's, um, it's 7.30, so I think we're going to go and... Um, follow up the questions uh, upstairs. Um, but thank you. I'd like everyone to congratulate you. you on your practice. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you.